All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about a new proactive web security solution from Juniper Networks called Mykonos. Um, so before I dive into this, what I'm going to do is kind of give you a little background on the web security problem. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with a lot of those uh, problems, but um, just a little review for those of you who aren't. Uh, then we're going to go over Mykonos in a bit of detail, what it does, how it works, and then I'm going to give you a hacking demonstration against a fake electronic retail store and show you how Mykonos detects those attacks and how it responds to those. So to start with, why are web applications such a problem? Um, and it, it really boils down to the fact that the perimeter, the network firewalls, let port 80 and 443 go straight on through. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can't block the front door if you expect to expose websites and things like that. Um, so they do do some things. They look for signatures, things like that. But you have to believe that the vast majority of... <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> You have to believe the vast majority of traffic is going to make it to your web servers, so you need to protect them. Um, so why are the web servers such an attractive target? And it, it boils down to a few factors. Uh, one is the static attack surface. You've got a website, it goes up there. It's not really going to change a whole lot. The architecture is going to stay relatively the same. The UIs might change a bit, but the overall URLs, the forms, the things like that that it's using to communicate data back and forth aren't really going to change. So the attacker has a long time to kind of reverse engineer your app, build up a profile of what your application is doing so that they can then go attack you. And it could happen months, you know, potentially years after they've done all this research. There are people out there just collecting information, stockpiling it, and then later on in the, you know, if they feel that you're an attractive target a year from now, they've got that information, they can then mount the attack much faster. Uh, open source code and frameworks are also a problem. You, I mean, they have vulnerabilities just like the apps you develop. And when you pull an open source uh, framework into your product, you then get all those vulnerabilities. And the attackers have the source code. So they can go reverse engineer what that code is doing and effectively attack you as if they were white box testing, which is a pretty big problem. Custom code, so whether you develop it in-house or you outsource India or wherever else, um, that's also a problem. You have a lot of engineers who are building this code that don't really understand the intricacies of web security. So they don't really know what to protect against, what types of threats their web applications are actually going to see. So they build great apps, but they're not necessarily uh, protecting for the vulnerabilities they're going to see. Um, black box applications suffer from all of these different issues. The main difference is you can't actually figure out where the vulnerabilities are, and you're less likely to be able to patch the holes once you do find them. You can call off the company, say, hey, you know, you've got this vulnerability, I want you to go fix it, but who knows if they're ever going to get around to it. Maybe it's a month from now, and by then, everybody's exploited the hole. So uh, you're kind of out of luck. And finally, you have the long life cycles of applications. So you might build an app. It could survive for months, potentially years, maybe even a decade. And so you've got a lot of different groups of developers all working on this application, and they don't really communicate with each other. Maybe the guys left the company six years ago, something like that. But in the end, you end up with a pretty messy piece of code that's uh, prone to vulnerabilities. So again, why do attackers hack the websites? Because it's low-hanging fruit and because they don't have to deal with the network perimeter. Um, so we can actually see this today. Gartner posits that 70% of all threats are at the web application layer. And Ponymon further elaborates that 70 <laughs> <laughs> Whether you trust these stats is another question, but... Uh, Ponymon further states that 73% of organizations have been hacked in the last two years through their insecure web applications. So those are pretty striking statistics. Uh, you know, who knows how accurate they are, but even if they're way overestimated, this is still a pretty serious problem and it needs to be dealt with. So to take a use case, for example, look at Sony. So Sony was hacked, huge public breach. Uh, probably the biggest uh, problem here is their 23-day network closure. 23 days is a very long time to close your network. Just imagine how many companies could actually survive a 23-day closure. And aside from the 23-day closure, look at the price tag. They're, they're actually suffering damages over a billion dollars. So again, that's another huge problem. They lost me. There you go. I, there's probably a lot of customers that they lost from this. Um, so clearly, we need a better way to kind of solve that problem. And this is where Mykonos comes in. And it's very different from a lot of the products that are out there today that kind of address the same problem, which is how do you protect the web apps? So uh, I'm going to kind of compare the, uh, the traditional web application firewalls and what Mykonos does in a little bit. But uh, to start out with, the key differentiator is that Mykonos is based in deception. Um, so a lot of the solutions out there are primarily based on signatures. They're looking for specific attack vectors, and they want to block those vectors. But Mykonos works on the philosophy that attacking is all about economics, whereas it used to be more about attackers attacking your website for fun or for sport. Now it's more about how do I get money out of you? So the key 
protection mechanism needs to be, how do you make your site so expensive to attack that it's just not worth the effort from the attacker's standpoint to go after it? Um, you can kind of compare this to, you know, two banks. One's got this huge vault, dual lock boxes, you know, cages, all that <coughs> stuff. Another, you know, bank has just a little safe off in the back room. Obviously, you're going to go attack the bank that has the little safe because you can just walk in there, grab the safe, and leave. So, with, again, you want to make sure your site is far more expensive and time-consuming for the attacker to attack, and you want to raise the bar so that it takes the more sophisticated and skilled attackers to go after you so that you can kind of weed out that 99%. All those bots that just kind of scan the internet, all the people who are just running tools, things like that, you can kind of eliminate those if you can raise the bar. So the way Mykonos works is through four key principles. First, we want to detect the attackers. Then we want to track the attacker through their entire you know, exploration of your site, reverse engineering, the vectors they're issuing, things like that. We want to profile that attacker, understand how skilled they are, figure out what they're capable of, what they're trying to go after, and what the most effective way to stop that attacker would be, which leads nicely into the response. Uh, once we've identified the attacker, once we know what they're after and how skilled they are, we want to select the most appropriate response to deal with that attacker. So this is kind of different from the traditional sense of you've got black and white, I want to block this traffic or I want to let this traffic through. What you have to think about is if you block a user, they're going to take every possible action they can to try to evade that block. And in doing so, as soon as they've figured out how to evade your block, they've also figured out how to evade you being able to track that those two events are related. So the best approach is to not block the attacker, but to mislead the attacker or to waste their time or to frustrate them and get them to give up. That way they continue the attack until they've exhausted their resources or the amount of effort they're willing to spend. And they don't try to get around any sort of block and they don't really realize that you've actually tracked them or tagged them or anything like that. So I'm gonna dive into each one of these a little bit and kind of give you a bit more color as to how they work. Um, but before I do that, I just kinda wanna briefly go over uh, the attack life cycle. Um, so a lot of you are probably familiar with the software development life cycle. Well, attackers follow kind of the same principle whether they know it or not. And that's basically there's phases to an attack. You can't just jump onto a site and say, I've got this vulnerability, I'm going to exploit it, now I have their database. I mean, we all hope that that's not the case. If you've got third-party software, they know there's a vulnerability, they could potentially get your database in a few requests. But for the most part, there's actually a process they have to follow. And even in that scenario, they still have to follow this process just potentially off-site on that application or using somebody else's. So the way the attack lifecycle works is basically first you need to do recon. You need to understand how the site works, understand the architecture, how it's laid out, where all the inputs are, where they go, where they get reflected, things like that. Um, that's kind of building up your knowledge of the, the, the app so that when you start to decide how you want to attack it, you know where those pieces are that are most likely vulnerable. And people are looking for things like pages on your app that are less used, less maintained. Uh, we've seen plenty of cases where somebody has a support ticket system that's meant for internal use only, but it's right in the directory slash support. There's no links or anything to it, but it's really not hard to, uh, to find the, uh, the directory that it's in. So uh, first they've got to do the recon, then they've got to start their vector establishment. So let's say I've found a form somewhere and I think that it's probably vulnerable to SQL injection or cross-site scripting or something like that. My next step is to actually start probing that form with various types of inputs to try to test to see whether it actually is vulnerable or not. And the goal isn't necessarily to actually compromise the site at that point, it's just to understand what's vulnerable. Um, so people will choose values that look uh, innocent, so one of my favorites is just using a name with an apostrophe and you know, O'Malley or something like that. Because if you look at the logs, you can't really tell that that was actually an attack to see whether you would have SQL injection or something on a form. It just looks like somebody submitting a name that's uncommon. So after you've determined where all these places are that might be vulnerable to these various types of vulnerabilities, your next step is to actually exploit the site. So we've gone through first step, second step, third step. I know that there's a vulnerability here. Now I'm just going to start trying to craft different ways to attack that particular field. So maybe it's a field that I know is vulnerable to SQL injection. So the next thing I'm going to do is just start launching different types of SQL injection attacks. Hopefully you don't have any sort of signature uh, testing stuff. But if you do, I just need to figure out what kind of attack I can launch that won't match your signatures. Um, and so you get through that whole process and you've actually exploited the site. You've pulled out their database, you've charged things to people's accounts that you weren't supposed to, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, your next step is to automate that attack. And you don't necessarily have to do this, not every attack is worth automating. 
But if it is, if it's something like stealing $10 from you know, a user's account, you might want to scale that out so you want to put in a lot of bots. Um, so you want to automate that attack. And then finally, the last one is maintenance. So this, this thing is out there. It's running on 1,000 bots. You're pulling in you know, $20,000 a day from all this activity. Eventually, the site's going to figure it out. They're going to put some sort of mechanism into their site to block whatever attack vector you are using to, to achieve that. So you've got to go back to square one. You've got to look at all your research, figure out where the next vulnerability is you're going to attack, and kind of progress from there. So it's just like the application, uh, the de uh, software development lifecycle. It goes right back around. Uh, again, you might skip from exploitation right back to discovery and all of that. But um, what we want to do with Mykonos is block those very early stages. So while a lot of the products out there are designed to stop the exploitation phase, where I know that there's a SQL injection vulnerability and I'm going to start pounding it, we want to stop it while you're trying to figure out how the architecture of the site works and while you're trying to probe the inputs to figure out what they're vulnerable to. <coughs> so that all boils down to detection. How do we detect things that are going on in the early stages before you're even launching an attack vector? And it, we, the key technology we use is something we call tar traps. Uh, there's a few other names out there, honey tokens, honey pots, things like that. But it's very different from a traditional honey pot in the sense that we're not putting out a server in the middle of the internet and saying, hey, this is a vulnerable FTP server. Go to town on it, and we're going to just track you. Because that, that's more theoretical and educational than it is uh, actually proactive in protecting your site. So what we do is actually lace your web application with these fake pieces of code all throughout the app. So we put in fake inputs, uh, fake links, things like that. And these are pieces of code the user is never, ever going to see. If you just render this page in a browser, they don't see these fake inputs. They don't see these fake links. So normal users will never touch that stuff. But as soon as an attacker comes on, they're looking at all your source code. They're trying to figure out where the stuff is that you don't want your users getting to. And so they are going to follow all these fake inputs. They're going to follow the fake links. And as soon as they do, we know for sure with zero false positives that that is an attacker. So here's a few examples that we have set up. Uh, we have the first one, which is a fake query string parameter. And I'm going to demo all of these so you'll get a bit more color. But uh, first one, basically, we look through your HTML pages. We figure out where you have links that go off to various services. Uh, and we'll actually stick fake query string values into those URLs. And the idea is the attacker is clicking through the site. They're looking at the URL. They're figuring, you know, what can I launch a SQL injection attack against? Or what can I manipulate to get some sort of different value? They're going to see these things. And in this particular case, we've injected debug equals false. So just a question to all of you, if you were navigating around a site that you felt like you wanted to get more detail from, how likely are you not to change debug equals false to debug equals true? <laughs> so you guys would fall into a separate category of the people who are going to start messing around with the site. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you do, we'll know about it, because <laughs> nobody else is going to. So that's a really what obvious one. <laughs> This is a really obvious one, uh, but another, a better one that's a little bit more obscure is the hidden input. So we're actually sticking hidden inputs into forms. And these are things that, so the top one, the user is going to see that. It'll be up in the URL bar. But these things, they're never going to see. The only way you can see a hidden input on a form is if you pull up like Firebug or something like that, or you view the source, and you actually look for those types of pieces of code. And you're only going to do that if you know how to read HTML and you kind of understand what a hidden input is and what inputs are and how to exploit the site. So again, this is not something any normal user would ever do. And then the last one is a, uh, so those first two are more about the breadth of deception. So we want to lace as much of your website as possible with these things. We want to increase the attack surface uh, astronomically large. We want it so that if the attacker tries to attack your site, the likelihood of them not tripping over at least one piece of fake code is pretty much nil. This last one here is more about depth of deception. Now, this is how we lead the attacker down a, a breadcrumb trail through an exploit that they think is going to be successful that takes time to actually accomplish, but is totally fake. So everything that they're doing, every exploit they actually find or figure out how to compromise your site, all is within a sandbox. They don't really understand that. But they're going to achieve nothing, waste tons of time, and you're going to learn a whole lot about how skilled that attacker is. So how far down that breadcrumb trail did they get before they had to give up? So here, this last one is an HT access file. So that's an Apache configuration file that's used to configure things like 404 error messages, uh, directories that you can't index, um, and password protect files. So what we'll do is we'll block any real HT access files that are being exposed, because theoretically you should never expose these files to begin with. Um, but we're going to push down a completely fake version of HD access. So the attacker sees this and they go, hey, there's a service out there called recoverpassword.aspx. Looks pretty interesting. 
if I can get to that service, maybe I can actually steal the administrator's password or something like that. But it's password protected, maybe I can't actually get to it. So the attacker might try, um, they're gonna get the password prompt, and a script kitty or something like that may actually have to stop here because maybe they don't know how to actually compromise a basic authentication page. Where is the attacker gonna discover that? Uh, so pretty much any site, I mean, I, uh, you know, when you penetrate and test a site, one of the first things you do is look for HD access. Because if you can find it, it'll give you all kinds of great information about the site. Okay, but that's not, I mean, you're not exposing <laughs> server config to the attacker. You're just putting a fake file out there? It's fake server configuration. So as the query, as the query response door, comes back server. through a the, fuzzy, the firewall or, or the, the, the Mykonos yeah. solution, then the, it presents that to the, the client. Correct. Site. So, yeah, so you're going you're to intercept the request and spoof the response as exactly. it came from the server. You're not actually going to touch the server. Correct. And when the, the, the code you're actually injecting, are you injecting that in line? Uh, yeah, I should probably step back one second and I'll answer your question. And Mykonos is a reverse web proxy. So we sit in front of the website. We have full capabilities to read and write to the HTTP stream going back and forth. So, okay, yeah. so that, that was actually what I was about to ask, and you may get into this in just a minute. So as a reverse web proxy, the stuff that you are injecting doesn't actually live on the server that you're protecting, Correct. right? Yes. Because that was the first thing I was thinking of was, this is really awesome, except it's so complicated that <laughs> you probably can only do this on like five programs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you're, you're basically, you know, you're, you're doing live stream monitoring and just at what you guys call a tar pitting. You're, you're sprinkling this fake info everywhere to see who nibbles on it. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So, so, I mean, how did, would somebody that you know, would somebody that has worked with Mykonos before, or you know, if they were also an attacker, would they not be able to, to look at this and say, huh, I'm seeing a lot of weird stuff here. This kind of looks like this is probably a Mykonos solution." Sure. So there are actually two sides to that. Uh, the first one is it doesn't really matter if the attack. Well, actually, let me cover the other one first. We actually randomize all of these things when you install the box. Mm -hmm. So every time we deploy to a customer, their machine has a set of default values that we can <coughs> randomly pick from. So things like debug equals false, we're picking from a pool of various key value pairs or dynamic key value pairs that we can use for that customer. So every customer has a different set of those, and then we randomly pick during installation which of those pieces to use. So any given customer who's compromised, they can't just take their list and say, okay, any site that's using any of these things is gonna be making us. Can those be reseeded if necessary? Correct, yeah. You can you can manually change them too. You can specify your own parameters if you want to do. So, so you know, in, in application, I have a, a, you know, you have somebody that's sort of an amateur hackerish type person and they, they log in and look at this and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that, that healthcare website's got all this crap in here. They, they, they can't possibly be secure, you know? And then they, they, they start rambling on about how insecure this site is because they see all this, you know, debug strings in the, the code and stuff like that. And is that a problem? Has that ever been a problem? Uh, I suppose it's a fair argument, but in order for that person to gain credibility that the site is in fact insecure, they'd probably have to prove that there is at least one vulnerability. And since all of these are fake, they're not actually going to achieve any compromise through them. Yeah, but, but you know, that person's like, well, I can attack it because if I do, I'm breaking the law. So I can't prove it, but this looks, uh, yeah, it looks like there's some locks here I could probably unlock pretty easily. So um, I guess the way you'd want to look at it is that uh, just because a site is exposing debug equals false doesn't necessarily mean that's a vulnerability. It's bad, it's not exactly something you'd want to expose to the customer, but that doesn't mean that they don't have some other policy somewhere that says, okay, debug equals false, yes, but we can only allow that to be true for the administrator. So, so does this also work uh, you know, like to, to prevent buffer overflow type of attacks like a, like a WAF or something would? I mean, I can see where tar pitting as a, as a response works well for things like brute forcing and stuff like that, but um, you know, will it also stop something like a uh, you know buffer overflow attack. So again, if you think about it from the terms of the attack lifecycle, if you can stop the attack in those early recon phases, it really doesn't matter what they're trying to accomplish in the long term. If you've stopped them at that phase, they don't ever get to the point where they launch the buffer overflow or they launch the SQL injection or something like that. Just to throw one out there, um, programming has always been a, one of those topics where it's slack programming. That's why people get in all mm -hmm. the SQL injects and all that sort of stuff. Does this give programmers a false sense of security? I can be slack now, I've got Mykonos. And that's a sort of bad, it's a promoting a bad thing, because it, it's how I'm sort of seeing it is, it's already pretty, uh, to get a solid programmer and not to put, because you can probably, if you're capable with your programming, there's no 
there are, you can uh, mitigate some of these things you're protecting against. Mm -hmm. it, do, you, do, have you, do you feel it's going to make the programmers a bit slacker? Like, I would hope not. We would. We, well, so would I. I'd hope not too. Yeah. But it sort of gives them, oh, it's okay, Mikimus is there. It gives them a false sense of security in some respect you, from that. You, you know, I don't want to respond uh, for him, but to me it's no different than it would be with any other security yeah. what, WAF. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, I was just throwing a general thought in my head. That's okay. it, is, it is a real concern, but yeah, I mean, we, we promote, you should still scan your code, you should still, you know, teach your developers what to look for. And that costs money. And that's it where does, some, yeah. And some for, for big apps, it's, that can cost a lot of money. And so the corner cutting can be there. Not, not, not in any disrespect to the product, I'm just saying it's a general observation of the industry. I sure. I guess the question is better put. I mean, again, those of us in security, you know, Security and you know depth and defense, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself replacing traditional IDS IPS? No, probably yeah. not, right? Yeah. So hmm. there's still traditional IDS IPS. If somebody hits you with a zero day, I don't think you're going to stop it, right? right? I mean, that's the, the role of traditional yeah. IPS IDS and signatures. So I mean, I'm just, that's awesome product. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about yeah. that's. You know, the, the, you're, you're basically putting you know little mouse traps out there. Exactly. And if awesome. they if yeah. they hook on it. You know, let them beat on it all they yeah. want. You know, who cares? It, I've never, never seen anything like it. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, you make a good point, but yeah, it's the, it's the problem with all security products. So is that, is it application based? Let me just understand the topology a little bit. Application based, software based, uh, and then talk maybe to HA a little bit. Sure. Um, actually, I'm going to cover those in a few later okay, slides, great. so we can get around to that. Um, anybody else before I move on? All right, so the, uh, the last one again, HD access. So we're just going to leave them down. We will actually let them get into recoverpassword.aspx if they can figure out how to crack the password and all of that stuff, which teaches us that that's a pretty skilled attacker. That's somebody we need to actually deal with right away. Um, and I'll get into what dealing with that attacker actually means in a few minutes. So the next one is tracking. So it's, it's one thing to say, OK, this particular request was bad because they manipulated a query parameter or they launched a SQL injection attack. But what you really care about is who, what the, the guy is actually doing long term. What's his actual you know, tr uh, pattern of traffic look like? So if he's just launching one particular SQL injection attack, that doesn't really tell you much. But if you can say, OK, well, he tried to get to this table. He tried to inject into my members form, things like that. That tells you a bit more about the attacker. But that means we need to be able to track all of the requests that that attacker makes. And that's actually really challenging. Uh, we can't do it by the IP address. There are a lot of proxies out there. There's a lot of people who are behind NATs, things like that. You can't necessarily say that because this IP address launched this attack, you need to block everybody from that IP address, or everything coming from that IP address is part of that malicious user's traffic. So what we try to do is track beyond the IP address. We want to track down to the specific device or piece of software that the attacker is running against your site. Um, so the way we do that is through several mechanisms. The first one is a super cookie. Um, so we actually push down a super cookie to the browser. And if you guys are not familiar with the term super cookie, basically what it is is a normal cookie that's backed up by Flash, Silverlight, HTML5 storage, IE storage, all the various persistence mechanisms on the browser. So we effectively place about seven different cookies throughout various different places in the browser that don't include just a regular cookie. So if you delete the regular cookie, we're able to reconstruct who you are based on all these other tokens that we've embedded in your browser. And you actually can't clear it. There's no way to clear all of those values at the same time. Like, there is format. <laughs> there is that approach, yes. And there's also the VM approach. You spin up a VM, you attack the site, you tear it down, you spin up a fresh one, now all your tracks are gone. That's time consuming. Exactly. And again, that bleeds into how do we make it more expensive for the attacker to target your website. Yeah. They've got to spin up a VM every five minutes. That's pretty expensive. Do you have uh, automation, like a hook into the firewall to throw a rule block as soon as you get the, the triggers? So we, we do have uh, syslog output. So you could tap that into pretty much anything. We also have a CLI you can pull all the information back out of. Um, and we have SNMP uh, alerts. So you could use those as well. But again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that because Mykonos will be able to figure out the better way to, to deal with that threat than just a straight out block. Um, so I would leave it to Mykonos to make that determination to impact the user, but you could theoretically do it. So uh, do you honor the do not track? Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are you there, is, <laughs> there is no rule that says you have to honor the do not track header, so we don't uh, honor it. Are you sending those super cookies to any visitor, or only those that you detect as 
Uh, we track user, everyone, so. but we don't collect information about users mm -hmm. that we don't believe are malicious. So while we're technically tracking you, if you don't delete your cookie, then <clears throat> none of that stuff comes into play. So it doesn't really matter. So anyway. you do send so, a super cookie to <laughs> every visitor's browser. Yeah. So 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 do you so know companies that use your product? Of that. Do they ever have anybody you know raise a red flag That's because true. hey we've set our do not track flag? We don't think our our site's tracking because. You know, we're not doing it at the site level, but then we install this Mykonos box, and suddenly we've got super cookie that's pushed down to you know to the to the device. So we weren't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> so from a technical standpoint, we don't give the the application behind us any way to use our super cookie to track the user within their own software. So it's kind of like a black box. Yeah. So from their privacy standpoint, they're not really adding any less privacy to their software. Um, from our standpoint. Uh, we advise them to put something in their privacy policy that, you know, notices the user that we are actually using this technology, and we have a, you know, kind of a template that you can throw in there. Is this in use at Juniper? Huh? Is this in use at Juniper? Uh, I can't comment on that. <laughs> Hang on a second. Is see. it in Juniper's privacy policy? Huh? Is it in Juniper's privacy policy and communications? That Wouldn't that be a yeah. pretty big giveaway that? Uh, software is installed. But. So that might be true, but how many people actually read the privacy policy of the website, and how many of the malicious users that are attacking that website read their privacy policy? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, but, it, but, but it, it, it could be a general user that, you know, gives a company a black eye for not properly, you know, honoring the do not track header. So, potentially. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's possible. Uh, again, we're not doing anything, like, we're not really tracking the user necessarily until they do something wrong. So we are maintaining this token. We are able to reassociate sessions that they've kind of pulled apart. But we're not collecting really anything about that user until they, they do something wrong. And I, I guess you'd have to kind of take us on our word for that um, from yeah. a user standpoint. You know, but you know, there would be some people that make the argument that that's sort of malware-ish. You know, <laughs> we're not actually the only ones doing this. The all of the, the it doesn't make it okay. <laughs> <laughs> all of the practices that we use, so using Flash to store cookie data. Uh, let's see, Hulu, Netflix, all those people. They're mm -hmm. using all these same techniques. Um, they're just not necessarily using them all in conjunction yeah. at the same okay. time. You can happily uninstall Flash, and then if that part doesn't display, therefore it doesn't load. If you want to use a site that's running behind Mykonos, you can't stop that happening. If you want to use that site, let's say, it's, let's say Google take you up on this. Mm -hmm. I can't use Google anymore because I refuse to abide by you putting something on my product, on my computer. So that's a sort of, I think the consensus is sort of what they're trying to get to is that if something, if we, if let's say every site that I use your product and you agree to it, there goes the internet. Yeah. Uh, what I'm you, it's against your, <laughs> sort of, you know. Yeah, what I'm saying is, is that, I, you know, I listen, this is a totally consumer based, consumer oriented uh, security podcast it's called Security Now. Uh, Steve Gibson, he, he preaches this all the time. Hey, enable, do not track, do this, don't do this. And, I, and, and the stuff that he he preaches and the points he makes to consumers all the time, you know, is that this do not track header is something that's really important. Now, I, you know, I don't think it really has any teeth until, you know, there's some legislation behind it or anything like that. But you are doing something to, to a PC that, you know, somebody has said a do not track. And then the company that implements the Mykonos solution, then at that point, they have to answer, you know, Juniper doesn't. You know, the company that bought the Juniper product, you know, is, is at that point have, you know, catching the black eye. That, I think your point was made. I mean, I think, you know, other companies are doing it. Why, why not do it? Sure. And, I mean, it also boils down to its security. I mean, do you, which is better, the mm -hmm. user being annoyed that you're yeah. using the super cookie or are you yeah. spending $2 billion to cover up the damage after a breach? Mm -hmm. you look, you, you're showing good intention. So it's mm -hmm. not like, it's, I suppose it's that, still yeah. it's that thing is, if they do it, I we can do it. It's this I suppose it's more the moral thing of it, but not it's not dissing the product. It's just sure. it's the internet's community's mindset, I suppose, is the thing that will get people riled up over this. And it won't be Mykonos's fault, it's the fact that everyone's pretty passionate about and it has different points of view on the whole yeah, like information is around. There's all sorts of arguments. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but, but yeah, so. And there's arguments for both yeah. sides. I think yeah. if a yeah. debate ever arose about say Google using a product yeah, like this. Say, well, Google sells your email, so <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. In terms of yeah. Europe, where they got the cookie laws, does this count outside the European Cookie Directive or whatever the hell it's called? That's a good question, and that's why we introduced the privacy policy template, is to appease the European Union cookie law. So as long as you notice the user that you're doing this, it's fine. Because okay, it's, so, it's so for you, security. But if a, a user, a, a hacksaw, goes to the website and it says, pops up and says, hey, can I set cookies? And you go, no. 
So that's not actually the law. The law isn't that you have to uh, allow the person to do it. You have to basically notice them that you're doing it and opt them, let them opt out of cookies that are non-essential. And we make the argument that security for your website is an essential use of a, a cookie or a tracking so you're, technology. So you're counting it along with session cookies and stuff like that that fall outside? Correct, yeah. Okay. So again, we still need to notice users, but we don't need to ask their permission, according to the law. Um, so that's the, the pr uh, one of the primary techniques we use to track users. Uh, that's not foolproof. Um, there are tools out there that help you try to deal with this. They're hard to use and not totally reliable because if you use one of these tools and it doesn't clear out all seven of them the exact same instant, they'll all repropagate. So those types of tools um, could potentially help the user who's more uh, interested in security. But to overcome those issues, we introduced fingerprinting as well. So this is a way for us to look at the header ordering, the header casing, things like that, of the request that you're issuing to the site so that we can build a fingerprint of you and then track all of your traffic based on that fingerprint. So whether you delete your cookies, whether you use private browsing, delete your VM, spin up a new VM, your fingerprints aren't gonna change. We'll still be able to track your attack. So the benefit of these two combinations is we're actually able to track a user past multiple proxies through different IP addresses. We're able to block a single user out of a large number of users on the same IP address. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to target the malicious users and not everybody. Um, so the next step is we want to profile the user. So we want to understand what the user is doing, what their skill level is, uh, what they're trying to accomplish so that we can determine what the best course of action is to get that user off your site uh, as fast as possible. So this is kind of a snapshot of our security monitor and I'm going to actually give you a demo of this piece too. So I'll just briefly go through it. Basically we give every attacker that we've identified a name. The reason we give them a name is because they could have 20 IP addresses, and you certainly don't want to be shouting 20 IP addresses across the room to say, hey, this guy's attacking us again. So we give them a unique identifier. In this particular case, it's Jack26. So now you can go look at everything he's doing, regardless of what proxy he's going through, or what VM he's using, or whatever else. So we'll show you all the different incidents that he's fired. We'll give him a threat level, so low, medium, high, uh, based on the sophistication of the attacks that he's launching. Um, and we'll tell you when he first came on the site, when he was active on the site, uh, what browsers and scripts and tools he's been using, uh, what IP addresses and the geo information for all those IP addresses, and also what responses that we've kind of activated along the way throughout their attack cycle um, to try to deal with that threat. We also give you kind of a free form notes field so you can kind of add notes as you discover more about the attacker. So, uh, this leads into the types of attackers that we deal with. So uh, again, we're trying to profile the attacker. We're trying to figure out. Sure. I had a question come in, not over Twitter, over I am. Um, so uh, you're, cla you're taking multiple, uh, not attack vectors, but attack sources and classifying them um, and, and lumping them into one, in one logical user. Um, what if, or I guess how are you doing that? Say if, they, say if the end user is using like Azure or EC2 to kind of distribute their, their attack sources at scale. So if they're distributing it, um, they're effectively going to have a unique fingerprint for those, that particular script. So we'll be able to track uh, based on that fingerprint. Okay. Um, so uh, kind of leads into different types again. So what you want to do is select the best response to deal with the type of threat. But it's interesting that you know, there, there's these five different categories that we've built up of the various types of attackers that you might actually see on your site. And each one of them would actually have a different type of response that would be most appropriate. And I'm gonna go through each of the specific responses, but just to briefly cover it, you've got the scripts and the tools. Um, so this would be the script kitties or just downloading some uh, exploit pack online, Metasploit, something like that, and just hitting your site with it and hoping that they get some luck. So they're pretty low level, there's a lot of them, and they're pretty easy to get rid of. Uh, you scare them just a little bit and they're gone. Uh, basically, you, you can think these people are operating under the premise that your site is not looking, you're not watching, they can do whatever they want and maybe you'll figure out about it a week later, but by then it's too late. So there's pretty much no risk instilled in anybody who's attacking a website, so the minute you give them any sense of risk, it's game over for those people. Uh, the next one is the IP scan, so this is the guy who's running a, bot or a script that's basically hitting every single website on the internet or some huge <coughs> chunk of them looking for something like a specific version of WordPress that has you know, a specific vulnerability they know about. They're gonna see if you have it, add you to a list if you do, and then later on they might come back to your site and exploit you through that hole. Uh, for these people, you want to prevent that script from ever successfully identifying the fact that you're running an outdated version of WordPress that's not patched, and you also wanna potentially block the known vulnerability in WordPress that's actually there. 
Uh, targeted scans, so this is when somebody downloads something like a Grendel scan or something like that, and they're running a scan to test your site specifically for every possible vulnerability you might have. So this is very different from running an exploit like uh, a tool like Metasploit, where it's testing you know one or two different vulnerabilities. This one's testing every single input on your site for cross-site scripting, SQL injection, uh, data reflection, pretty much anything you can think of. Um, and for those tools, uh, we want to make the results of the tool completely useless. So we want to feed the tool all kinds of false information. So when the attacker goes and looks at it, they say, okay, this thing came back and reported 3,000 vulnerabilities. Maybe one of them is actually accurate, but the likelihood of them going and vetting every single one of those 3,000 to find the one that's real, not really likely. So if you can feed the tool enough bad information so that the results uh, can't be used, um, then you've eliminated that threat. Uh, the next two are kind of in their own category. Botnets can effectively be any of these things. Um, they're just distributed uh, on a whole bunch of different machines. You can't really uh, tell, you know, it could be Windows, Linux, whatever else. Um, and then human hackers behind all of this. Uh, but in this particular case, we're talking about the APT that's decided to target your website specifically. So this is the guy that's going, you know, I want to attack NASA. I'm just going to spend all my time attacking NASA. I don't really care how long it takes. We're just going to go after it. And so these are the people that do things like Sony. Um, so again, all these people need different types of responses. So what are the responses and who are they most appropriate for? Uh, first off, warning the user. This is great for human hackers uh, as long as they're low level. So we kind of group that into the script kitty category. Again, instill the slightest bit of risk and they're off your site. So you throw up a warning message that says, hey, we know you're up to no good. That's going to be game over for them. Uh, the next one is block user, and this is not something that you would want to do to an APT, because if you block somebody who's, say, trying to attack NASA, they're going to figure out how to get around your block, and they're going to keep attacking you. If you can do something else to them that doesn't make them realize they've been identified, then they're going to keep going and potentially be less effective because of whatever you're doing. But for just about everything else, if you block it, like, for example, the automated uh, targeted scan, you block that, it's not really going to understand that you blocked it. It's just going to say, okay, every page is coming back with the same content now. Maybe I'm blocked, maybe I'm not. It's not really going to know. Uh, the next one is force capture. So this would be, I want to block you because I think you're an automated tool of some sort, but I'm going to give you the option to prove that you're not. So we throw up the capture. It's effectively every page they try to access gets the capture until they solve it, and then they can get back on the site. Uh, slow connection is a good one. As soon as we detect pretty much anything malicious from a specific user, we'll start to, start to slow their connection down. Uh, we do that randomly so that it's impossible to say, okay, well, every request now is three seconds longer, so clearly something is impacting me specifically. We start to do it between like two and a half and like eight seconds worth of latency for every request that you issue. Um, so maybe you figure out something's weird. Maybe you think you've actually damaged the site in some way. You've launched a VOS, whatever the case may be. Uh, but you're not going to... Um, to get very far, and you're gonna, we're gonna have more time to analyze what you're trying to do to the site, and we're gonna frustrate the hell out of you. So, you know, just imagine any site you've been on that takes five, six seconds to get to every single page. How likely are you to continue navigating that site, trying to gain more information and use the site? You might, but if your na the neighboring site is likely as vulnerable as you are, and they're not as slow, they're gonna move off to your neighboring site. Uh, simulating the broken application. So this is a good one for APTs. Basically what we'll do is make it look like your web application is broken. It's no, not functional anymore. We'll render pages incorrectly. Uh, we'll strip out pieces of code. We'll throw back 500 errors, things like that. And the idea is we want the attacker to either believe that they've had success in breaking your website or we want them to think the website's actually broken. And again, this is just for that one user, so it's not happening to everybody. A tool like Grendel Scan or something like that that's pounding your site trying to figure out what's going on is never going to be able to figure out that's what you're doing. It's going to see all kinds of weird responses and believe that that's in response to whatever the tool is actually trying to do. Question for you. Sure. Do you use anything besides the IP address to identify the user? I know you mentioned like super cookie, but uh, you know somebody running scripts, it's not actually using a browser. Sure. So say it's somebody that's running, you know, that's uh, hitting your website over Tor or through a number of different proxies or things like that. So for Tor, uh, the super cookie would likely take place because it's still a browser, even though it's going through this weird network of nodes. But in it, the end, it's I mean, still... If they're not actually using a browser. Sure. So if they're if using they're a script or something scripts. like that, yeah. um, then the script is going to have a fingerprint that we'll be able to identify from like the, the way that it sends requests, so the header ordering, things like that. Um, and we'll be able to tag the script based on that stuff. Uh, the next one, so I talked about simulate the broken application. The next one's break authentication. So this is great for things like brute force attacks. 
So you can imagine an attacker is just going after your login form. They're trying, you know, admin as the username and just pounding it with every possible password they can think of. At some point, most solutions will just say, okay, this, this IP is bad or this particular user is bad. Let's block it. What we'll do instead is we'll start hashing their password every time they submit it. So they submit their request, it goes through Mykonos, we hash their password, we let it go off to the backend web server. The backend web server is obviously going to reject it because the password can't possibly be correct after we hash it. And it's going to come back with the standard response for your username and password is not correct. So from a brute forcing uh, tool's perspective, it's, it hasn't been blocked. It can get through its entire dictionary. But even if half of those dictionary entries would have matched legitimate passwords, it's not going to actually come back and say it found anything because the website kept responding that the username and password were invalid. So you'd be doing that at the HTTP layer? Yeah. You're actually doing the, intercepting the HTTP flow? So it's the reverse web proxy. So the request would hit us first right. as if we were the web server. Right. And that's when we screw it up. And then we let that get off to the back end web server where it comes back and says it's bad. But, so you would also have to blind the fact that reverse proxy can't be visible. Normal proxies would signal back. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's behind your, your firewall and it's within your network. So yeah. from the user standpoint, anything we serve back is mm -hmm. as if it came from your regular web server. Yeah. There's nothing that we're injecting that would uh, make it appear as though there were a proxy in the middle. Yeah. How are you playing with SSL on this? Uh, if you upload your SSL cert to Mykonos, then we can decrypt your traffic. Okay, so you're actually doing the SSL offload effectively on the Mykonos box now so that you can talk unencrypted on the back end? Or? We can, yeah. Uh, we, can do, we can offload it or we can re-encrypt before it goes back <coughs> again. I assume that's being done in hardware. Uh, currently, we're a software solution, um, so it's it's being done at the software layer. Uh, we would recommend. I mean, if you have a load balancer or something like right. that, obviously it can do the offloading for you. Um, but there's there's contemplation as to whether a hardware solution might be available at some point. Cool. Do you come on later on to scalability and capacity at throughput that kind of thing? Do we what? Later on in your presentation, do you come on to scalability of the solution? Um, I can talk about that uh, briefly now. Uh, basically, the way we work is uh, we can operate in a single server mode um, or we can cluster out. So we'll have a master node that deals with actually aggregating all the information and presenting the consoles and all that stuff. And then we have traffic processing nodes. And those are the actual reverse proxies. Um, so you can scale that out to achieve higher throughput. Um, and we add about 14 milliseconds of latency uh, for about a gig a second through one, one machine. These are appliances, presumably? Uh, it's or, or is it just, you know, you provide your own servers, you know, here's a VM, here's some software, go for it. Yeah, currently it's um, whatever hardware you want to put it on, or VM machine or whatever else, yeah. I, I'll show you the, the options there in All a minute. Right. If you're SSL offloading, you're going to have issues with that amount of traffic coming through with a CPU, correctly, if you're doing, if you're doing it in a VM, would you not? Yeah, the, the so throughput the, does, in fact, get a little bit degraded. If so you, would you be better off? Having a, is there a hardware compliant? Let's see if something's got a try. Is it the Trident chipset that does SSL offload or whatever one that does? Is it better to have something like that running the VM so it can do the offload? Uh, you certainly it, could, yeah. One, some people might have 10 gig, 20 gig, 40 internet facing traffic. So they might well use this at that scale. What we've actually seen from uh, the majority of people we talk to, and this doesn't include you know the top 30 companies or whatever, yeah. but for the majority, most people are doing sub 100 megabits a second okay. on their website. Yeah. Because we're talking purely HTTP traffic, yeah, not okay. you know, FTP, all that other stuff. So for those people, they probably have plenty of extra CPU to handle the SSL yeah. offloading. If you were actually up in that scale of 30 gigs a second or something, then you might want to do that, yeah. So I just was thinking that with scalability, it's one of the maybe bottlenecks, but as you, you just counted that, so no yeah. worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the last one is forced logout. So we detect that you're, let's say you're, in a, you're attacking a shopping cart. You get all the way through. You filled out your address. You filled out where you want it shipped to, any coupon codes, all that stuff. So you've gotten through like six or seven steps of this process. You're on the very last one. You want to attack the credit card payment form. And we log you out. That all goes back into economics. So you have to go through all seven steps again to get to that last step to go re-attack it. And if we keep doing that to you, your attack cycle has just gotten so much longer that it's just not worth doing anything. Um, you might want to, you might even believe that you'll actually have success <coughs> at some point. It's just too frustrating to continue. So, so how do you build awareness of, so obviously there's two things here. One is if you're going to simulate broken applications and do forced logouts, you're going to have to train the application what your store or what your application looks like, or you're going to have to have fingerprinted all the applications in the whole wide world. Basically all we do is we transparently eliminate all your cookies. So ses your session's likely being tracked through a cookie, so we drop it, your session's logged in. I think, uh, I think, I don't, 
think I understand that then. Because to me, that's that's telling us how, how, how did you, I think what Greg's saying is how do you know for sure that this is an attack? So, like, if you were to uh, change debug from false to true, it's an attack. We'll log you out. Yeah, that 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 would be obvious. But yep. you know, everything's not going to be a manipulation of those variables. So everything everything in attacking a website is a manipulation of some input. You need to get data into the system somehow in order to exploit it. See, I had this problem when I first started looking at the product right after you guys were purchased, and I think that what it comes down to is, is that they're putting the specifically special crafted values in there. They're basically setting a trap for an automated tool. Nobody in their right mind would do this. Yeah, yeah, if you have a, you know, you can, ha you can put an invalid value in a valid variable. And I, I, I've not heard how this protects from that. So I think what you're getting at is kind of what we call the hole in one, which is you go onto the site, you see a credit card form, you see a specific field on that form, and through some magic, you, f you know that that form input is vulnerable to something, and you just start attacking it. So in that particular case, currently with the, the solution that we have, we would not detect it because it's an actual input within your application. But in reality, nobody is that specific. Yeah. You have to try lots of stuff before you. Yeah, and, and, and I guess that's, again, like he said, it's not this on the, you know, your, your solution. I, I actually quite like you know, what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. I, I was just. So you don't need to have awareness of the application to function. Correct. Yeah. You're just watching for cookie, cookie mangling. Which is one of the, the key points mm -hmm. when we built the solution. We wanted to make sure that it was a dead simple to install. We didn't want you to have to go through months of configuring this thing. We didn't want you to have to understand regular expressions or attack vulnerabilities to write signatures. Um, we wanted you to basically drop it in, point your traffic through it, and you're good to go. I've done your and you don't also website. have to keep a library of all the potential. Yep. You don't want to have to map a, a fingerprint for every WordPress version and every Drupal and every right. Exactly. And, and then for custom enterprise apps, have to develop a fingerprinting solution. So, so what you're saying is you're, you're, you're looking for manipulation of what you stuck in the stream, in the response. And when you do so, you, you keep the cookies from the client from returning to the server. In the particular case of force logout, yeah. Okay. But we do that at Mykonos, so the user has no idea. They're still submitting right. cookies. We're just dropping them before they get to the back end. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Quick question for you. Sure. When, uh, you were talking about the brute force authentication and breaking that. If you detect they're doing it, you're just automatically going to basically intercept it and send back that mm -hmm. it was invalid, even if it was. Does that only work with uh, HTTP's basic authentication, or is that actually that works tying in with some type of like form-based plug-in. Whatever you have. We've, we've built it. I bet that's one particular feature you do have to do a little bit of configuration for. You basically have okay. to tell us that's, how to observe a login. Yeah, that's what But it's dead simple. You know, here's the URL people log into. Here's yeah. the name of the field. You're done. The variables in the query stream. Yeah. Yep. But we can do basic auth. We can do AJAX. We can do regular just form posts. We can do it through gets. Pretty much anything you could come up with. And there's, also, there's, a, there's a bit more into that, so it's a whole feature as far as how to protect the login field. So we'll do things like look for users who are logging into multiple accounts, and we'll flag that. Uh, we'll look for a single user who's generating a whole bunch of accounts. We'll look for lots of different users logging into the same account, so account sharing. Um, we'll look for people who are submitting different usernames but one password for each, basically trying to figure out who's a valid username. So we're looking for all those types of behaviors, and we'll be able to tell you what they are and then flag the most, or activate the most appropriate response. So that's, uh, that's kind of an overview of the key points of the technology. Uh, here's kind of the uh, snapshot of our dashboards. This is the tool that we give administrators to kind of see all the real-time activity on the website. Um, so you could throw this up in a networking center and basically just watch it all day if you wanted to. Um, it'll show you the, uh, the attack vectors that we're seeing, how severe they are, uh, what countries are hitting you, um, what types of counter responses that we've deployed to deal with those threats, and then by the last week, basically how many users you've had on your site. So when I say we push down the, the super cookie to every user, it's effectively to track how many users you have on your site, how many unique users. And then you can compare that to how many of them are hackers. So in this particular case, you can see there were 39 legitimate, or 39 users on the site, 34 of them were actually hackers. So this site was getting pretty exploited. Uh, and then we have the last one, which kind of shows you the number of actual vectors that we've uh, observed. So the number of these honeypots and things like that that have been tripped. 
Um, again, we have the SMTP alerting, reporting, uh, so we can generate PDFs, HTML, things like that. Uh, CLI, so any information that we expose to you in our administrative console can be pulled out through the CLI. And that can come out in CSV, XML, HTML, um, and plain text if you want it. Uh, and all of this, again, is real time. So you can just watch it all day long. It'll keep updating. Um, so to kind of go into the deployment options, uh, which you had asked before, uh, we can deploy an ISO to internal hardware, so whatever server you want to load it on. Uh, we can also do virtualized environments, so VMware, you can just throw our VMware image in there. And we also have cloud services, so if you want to throw one of these up in front of a bunch of Amazon Web Services or something <coughs> like that, you can do that as well. <coughs> Um, so the idea here is you've got apps living in all kinds of different places. You want to be able to intelligently gather and track threats across all of them. So you want to be able to deploy in front of all the different places your apps reside. Uh, and then we can kind of show you the, uh, the global picture of what's going on. So we did a case study uh, initially. This was with Brown Printing, um, one of the largest printing companies in the US. And uh, basically, we dropped the solution in, and within 20 minutes, they had it up and running. So that speaks to how easy this thing was to configure. There were no rules to write. Uh, they didn't really have a whole lot of understanding of what web security uh, threats were out there and how to protect against them. So that was great. Most of that time was just downloading the VM from our servers. Uh, and then 10% of their traffic was actually malicious within a week that they were running this thing. So that was a pretty big eye opener. They had this random like marketing website that nobody really knows about off in some corner. And yet 10% of the traffic that was hitting it was actually malicious. Here they thought nothing was going to be malicious because nobody knows about it. So it's kind of a wake-up call for organizations who don't believe they're getting attacked. Because it happens all the time, every single website. You have an IP, you're going to get attacked. And we've kind of presented this in a few different uh, areas. So SC Magazine recognized us, The Wall Street Journal, CNET 16, and Gartner. Oh. Next. Oh. Next. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the slide presentation, so. I've got a question. Uh, sure. Uh, can, is it a one-to-one -one relationship between an app and the deployed Mykonos appliance or whatever, or can that appliance protect multiple websites behind Yeah, it? no, each, each uh, instance of Mykonos can protect any number of websites. Oh, okay, cool. Are you happy to discuss live or a licensing or when it's released and a subscription if how it, that works, or is that not at your... I can video. talk at a high level to it, but I'm but an architect, so... Like, am I expecting to pay six figures for this thing, or is it going to be a cheap thing per year, or is it, like, because it could be cost prohibitive for smaller enterprise or large sure. enterprise, so well, is there a certain market you're going after in so, so scale and size? Or um, so, up to this point, we've been targeting mostly larger enterprises, so the, the price structure that I can talk about, and there are other structures as well, but uh, just at a high level for one gigabit a second, Per geographic location, we do a subscription for 175 a year. Um, so that's about 175 dollars or 175 thousand. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, not dollars. <laughs> um, it was worth a try. It's worth it. Hey, it's worth a try. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm Australian, so we, we can do that sort of thing. You never know. So, <laughs> <a> conversion. <laughs> you, you mentioned that your application is uh, software based. What about for uh, users that have their websites up at EC2 or Azure? You know, do you, are, are you implemented in any of those uh, setups? Not currently, um, and I'm not sure what the plans are for those. Uh, they could easily set up a our proxy to run somewhere else and point mm -hmm. traffic through it and still have it hit the EC2 cloud or whatever else. So it is doable, um, but we don't have any plans as of yet to integrate directly. Into you, you mentioned specifically Amazon AWS. Yeah, Amazon, we, we have an image do you, for. Do you have an AMI image ready yeah. to deal with that in there? You do? So you have an AMI What's image, but you won't protect anything that's running up in EC2. We will. You just have to configure it. Yeah. It's all about where you want to run the proxy from. OK. And then you can proxy traffic to wherever you want. I mean, I could install it on my desktop and proxy for Google. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. OK. What, what's okay. A, do you have a ballpark on the uh, pricing if you're deployed on AWS? Uh, I don't. I know, I know it's different when you start talking about not having you know, a physical machine within your geographic location. And again, that's per geographic location, so you could have a million sites behind it in that one geographic location. Um, so for hosting providers, things like that, it prevent, potentially adds a value add to their customers. On the, on the rare occasion where you need to go to court, you need to preserve logs, is there some nice, easy button to click to say, export logs, wrap it up, sign it, and go? Or 
Are, are you stripping syslog out? Are you stripping? <laughs> That's a good question. We haven't yeah. gone through the formal process of like uh, forensics and you know, right. just to determine chain of custody and all that stuff. But we don't give the, the, the administrator any ability to modify any of this data that's being collected. Um, so they can't modify it from our system. However, yeah, I mean, there might be protocols as to who can get it off the system and whatnot, and we haven't investigated that yet. But in theory, the, the data should be perfectly intact. You should be able to take it out and use it in the court of law. So that's all I had for the slide presentation. So the next thing I was going to do is dive into the demo. So if anybody has any remaining questions before I do that. When you're doing tracking of, of attackers, oh, well, just ready to it. Yeah. Go. other than uh, the, the cookie the and the IP address and stuff, did I understand that one of the things that lets you track them is you're seeding them with bogus information and when you see that reused? Um, that's. The, it's mainly based on the, the fingerprinting of the HTTP profile, the traffic that you're generating. Okay, not like you reveal a, a username that, that it, when that username is tried to be accessed later, you know it's the same guy or something like that. Correct, yeah. I mean, that's something we're considering. Um, but, you know, there's only so many cycles in a day, so <laughs> we've got to prioritize. And we've actually found that our tracking techniques are pretty effective. We don't really have too many cases where somebody's actually able to shake it and start an attack somewhere else. Um, so, so far, we haven't needed to go any further with that. And, and I would assume this is basically how uh, you, you have a patent on this process. Mm. Is, is that the case? Not on the, the super cookie, because that was right, out right. And unpatented right. when it was. But, but the, the whole technique of everything we do, yeah. yeah. So who's your competitors in this space? Uh, so it would be pretty much any other web application firewall vendor, so <coughs> Perva, Barracuda, F5, all those people. But the key differentiator is all of, all of those solutions work on signatures. So they've got to keep a database up to date, and if it's something that they've never seen before, they're not going to catch it. And if you're reverse engineering the site, you're not launching any vectors, so they're never going to see that traffic either. That could be having an argument about heuristics versus signature matching, which is better. Yeah, <laughs> 